So good morning, sorry, how are you? Uh, we were gonna welcome everybody from Zoom Live and uh, everybody from the uh, Maki Derm Facebook. Uh, welcome back to the second lecture now in Back to Basics uh, series that Dr. Maki has kindly um, agreed to give us. And this is a free uh, webinar that he has prepared for us. And I hope that everybody will enjoy this. And uh, Dr. Maki, are you ready? Yes, I am indeed. Well, first of all, I must apologize to everybody with the technical problems we, we, we've been facing. This is, in fact, it's taken us about an hour to get uh, Zoom working between Ivan and myself. I don't know what was going on, but anyway, I think we're good to go an hour. And um, I, I wanted to start by um, last week's presentation. I think time ran away with itself and it turned into a rather, rather a marathon event. So Ivan and I decided this week we would limit it to roughly speaking one hour and um, generally speaking, I think we should keep comments and questions to the end of the presentation, unless something comes up that really is really important that I address it now. So I'm going to be talking about my favorite topic of spitzoid neoplasms, and in particular, addressing the, the concept of atypical spitz nevus and spitzoid melanoma. Now, I don't want to be repeating myself too much, but many of you know I've never been very happy with the term atypical spitz nevus, largely because the histological features that distinguish uh, spitz nevus from atypical spitz nevus from spitzoid melanoma end up being rather a continuum and, and some people might call a lesion a spitz nevus and somebody else might call it an atypical spitz nevus and so on. And I think we ended up with a, a situation of chaos in the spitz nevus family. Now, excuse me, uh, it's been with great relief to me that the uh, more recent advances in molecular pathology as related to the Spitz nevus family, I think they've managed to, to, to add um, some clarity to our situation. And so uh, with the advent of the recognition of the the BAP1 inactivated nevi and the, the recognition of the various uh, um, kinase fusion translocations ha have resulted in, in us being able to classify uh, spitzoid lesions in, in a much better way. Although, as you'll see from the black bit at the bottom, we still have a sizable chunk of um, uh, uh, spitzoid neoplasms where we don't have uh, any great clarity. And I'll be coming back to this chart uh, several times again in the course of this talk. Sorry. Um, so uh, once again, I just wanted to use this, this um, slide to remind us that uh, this little melanocyte never knew what hit it before it became a, a spitz nevus, uh, in, in, in which uh, in addition to HRAS mutations, uh, kinase fusions are commonly encountered. And I would make the point that the, the same uh, genotype is seen in the atypical Spitz tumor as well, uh, but in an atypical Spitz tumor, as we'll come to later, there are other um, additional uh, events which, uh, which govern the transformation from Spitz nevus towards an atypical Spitz tumor, 
And again, further genetic events take place before the, the uh, atypical Spitz tumor can evolve into a Spitzoid melanoma. I, I'm working on the assumption, although I, I don't have it um, in terms of literature confirmation, but I'm assuming that the melanocyte can go straight to Spitzoid melanoma if it chose to, rather than necessarily going through this pathway. But no doubt the, um, the, the more molecular minded members of the audience can clarify that situation if they want to at the end. So I wanted to start with this case. Um, it, it, it really is going back into the dim recesses of my, of my pathology memory. This was a case that um, I encountered when I was working at St. John's Hospital for Diseases of the Skin. And it, it was a, it was clinically, it presented as a nevus on the scalp of a, I think she was a fairly young woman. I can't give you the actual age, but she might have been in her twenties, let's say. And um, this in a way is, is the, it's the textbook appearance of what a BAPOMA or a, or a BAP1 inactivated nevus looks like because one has this dome shaped nodule. One can see at one side, and I'll show you that in high power later, uh, pre existent banal nevus. And here there are lymphoid aggregates. And those are the three features that one sees most often in a BAPOMA. And this is that side on the right hand side that I mentioned to you. And there's, there's, um, there's a little tiny bit of junctional activity, but it's, that's about all there was. And then you've got a, a clearly a banal nevus composed of type B cells in the in the superficial dermis and here here we see uh nevoid cells i'm not going to call them nevus I, I think nevoid is a safer way to describe these merging almost imperceptibly with large epithelioid cells with conspicuous nuclei uh, fairly prominent nucleoli, and these eosinophilic hyaline cytoplasmic inclusions. Now, when I reported this case, um, my mind was going in a variety of directions. When I looked at the left-hand side, this looked to me like a, it was probably going to be a nevoid melanoma. But then on the right hand side, um, rhabdoid melanoma had become fashionable. And so I thought, well, I, I think this must be a rhabdoid melanoma. And so that's what I diagnosed it as. And this is probably, oh, I don't know. I'm gonna guess 30 years ago. But uh, with, uh, with the uh, opportunity for hindsight, it was, it's clearly obvious that what I thought was a rhabdoid melanoma was in fact, a, we'll call it a BAPOMA, which is the easiest term to remember. And there you can see some high power views, um, very prominent nucleoli, uh, and there are some cytoplasmic pseudo inclusions which I have, uh, I, I see are, are thought to be more commonly seen in the inherited form of, uh, of BAP1 inactivated nevi, although I have no knowledge of whether there was a family history or anything else about this particular patient, but that's just an observation in passing. And uh, there was quite marked nuclear pleomorphism. There's a huge nucleus there, which gives you an idea as to why we thought this was melanoma or why I thought it was melanoma. And there's an atypical mitosis. But I don't have any follow up, unfortunately, on that patient. But I think that must be the first BAPOMA that I ever saw, but I misdiagnosed it. Now, 
Um, although I like the term BAPOMA because it's very convenient, I think um, the WHO classification, which talks about combined nevus uh, and BAP1 inactivated nevus melanocytoma, I think that's probably what we should all be using. I, I mentioned in last week's talk that we need to all be on the same page. And although we've got all of these alternatives, um, I think uh, I think it would be best if we all use WHO, and that's what I that's what I propose to do for the rest of my talk. Um, I I was searching the literature just to see what I could find out about these lesions clinically, and there's a very nice paper. Uh, on syndromic BAP1 uh, melanocytic tumors. For some reason, I've left the year out there, but you can find it in PubMed easily enough. And A, B, C, D, and F are for from syndromic patients, and E is non syndromic. And what I find that was particularly uh, interesting was the, the peripheral rim of melanocytic pigmentation around the dome-shaped nodule and this this rim represents the uh, the pre-existent banal nevus component now it's quite interesting um, we, we we understand that bat one inactivated melanocytic tumors um, may occur either as a sporadic phenomenon or as an inherited phenomenon. And interestingly, I've seen, I've seen an awful lot of these now, um, some in consultation and many from Makedam, and none of the cases that I have encountered so far have been syndromic. They've all been sporadic. Um, so what do we know about this, this tumor? Well, the first thing is it's, the, the incidence is, is uncertain. It's probably commoner than we think. And that's largely because most of them have been misdiagnosed. Many of them have been called Spitz nevus, which is probably no great harm. But on the other hand, some of them have undoubtedly been misdiagnosed as nevoid melanoma. And so one, I think in the future, one, one is looking at a lesion that one thinks might be a nevoid melanoma. It would be very prudent to look for BAP1 expression to make sure that one isn't misdiagnosing a BAPOMA. But clinically, they can present just about anywhere. They tend to be in, in the younger age group and they may be pigmented or erythematous. Or erythematous. Now this case that Antonina Kalmakova very kindly shared with me, I think it shows a lovely example which looks rather keloidal and I've seen a number of uh, these lesions that, that present clinically looking a bit like a keloid. Now, the, the, the important thing about recognizing this tumor, particularly when there are multiple, is that this may uh, uh, be a cutaneous manifestation of, of an autosomal dominant germline mutation. And that's really very important because if a patient fits into that category, then he or she is at risk of multiple um, serious tumors, including um, high-grade uveal melanoma, uh, mesothelioma, blue nevus-like melanoma, renal cell carcinoma, and a variety of other, other tumors. And um, in the inherited variant, it's thought that ultraviolet light or, or asbestos exposure may be the, the cause of the second hit uh, resulting in the manifestation or expression of the, of the dis disorder. 
Um, it's interesting that when we look at um, malignant Bapum, or what, uh, if you like, as an entity, it's extremely rare. It's less than 1% of all melanomas. And I summarized some, some information, uh, and I want to recommend this paper to you by uh, um, Zhang and co-authors, which includes Lynn Duncan as the team leader from Mass General. And it really is an awfully good paper. I, I found it, uh, it's extremely helpful in terms of talking about the, um, the, um, the nomenclature, the, the molecular genetics, the histopathological features and so on. So I'd recommend this to you all. Uh, it, uh, unless, of course, you're an expert in the topic yourself. And the, the, the interesting thing about the, these tumors is that they, they don't show HRAS mutations that you see in Spitz nevus. They tend to sh more commonly show BRAF mutations in nearly 90% of cases. Uh, in, in, uh, in addition to showing loss of BAP1 expression in the epithelioid cells, the BAP1 expression is not lost in the nevus cells if the nevus is actually present. And uh, this is a nice low power example that uh, Victoria Kazluskaya from the University of Pittsburgh very kindly shared with me. It's a male age 27. Uh, I make the point that junction involvement may be a clue to a germline mutation, which Garfield and co-authors uh, commented on. Unfortunately, other than my first case, as I mentioned, none of mine actually have any junction involvement. Perhaps that's an indicator as to why mine all are all sporadic. But anyway, uh, and here's an important, this is an important slide here. This is um, a high power view of my first case. And I, I put this in to remind you that um, what you sometimes think as being a nevoid melanoma may be uh, a BAT1 inactivated neva. So it's important that you do look at BAT1 expression in entities that you think might be a, a nevoid melanoma before you, you pull the trigger and make the diagnosis. And the histology, uh, it may be spitzoid, as I've shown you, it may be rhabdoid. And it's also worth noting that um, BAP1 loss may also be seen in, in blue nevus-like melanoma, though unfortunately I don't have an example of that to share with you. Now, um, as I've mentioned, most of these lesions, they differ from, from Spitz nevus in that they lack the, the acanthosis, they lack the clefting, and disassociated junctional uh, epidermal component as seen in the Spitz nevus, and they don't have the Camino bodies. And they tend to be epithelioid rather than spindle-celled. The spindle cell populations that we think about in Spitz nevus are much more commonly seen in the alt fusion lesions. And um, Clues to the diagnosis are, 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 at least a good clue, is the presence of a lymphocytic infiltrate, which just draws your eye to it. But obviously when you look closely and you see these large rhabdoid or ground glass cytoplasmic uh, inclusion cells, uh, that's a tremendous tip that you're looking at one of these lesions. And um, if you do immunohistochemistry, remember it's the nucleus you're looking at. So you get BAP1 loss in the nucleus. And um, I mentioned this paper by Gammon and his co-workers where sometimes, in, although you see loss of BAP1 in the nucleus, you see some perinuclear clumps in the cytoplasm 
which are remnants, if you like, of that one. Although I, I again, I haven't seen that personally. So this is a, a, a lovely example. And this is a case that was described, was that was seen rather before that one was was recognized. And uh, so this was this was a, a thought to be a melanoma. And Eduardo Colongi very kindly shared it with me. And I, I think this this may represent a rather more nevoid element. It, it looks more tumorous than, than just a banal nevus. That population of cells worries me a bit, but the diagnosis becomes much easier when you see um, the large numbers of these epithelioid cells with these inclusions. And there were multiple mitoses all over the place. So I can see why we called it a uh, a melanoma. Now, uh, as we'll come to later, whether this falls into the atypical, uh, the melanocytoma as per the WHO, or whether it's actually a, 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 a back one a, a melan a melanoma, I don't know, because I don't have the follow up, but it's certainly a very worrying histology. Now, this is a, another lovely example that, that Victoria again has shared, shared with me. And this, this we can see, it, it's a lesion on the, on the nose, a pedunculated lesion. And this is really clearly seen on the scanning view on the top right. Uh, if we look on this side, you can see the pre-existent nevus. Uh, which is all dermal, there's no junctional component. And then on the left side, you see this great big nodule, which represents this bit uh, that you see clinically. And uh, uh, there's another view of it there. And we'll look at that in close up. And here we're looking at the, um, the uh, dermal nevus bit. There's more of the dermal nevus, and there's a very heavy lymphocytic infiltrate. And on the bottom left, we can see the, the typical cells, again, in high power on the right with these hyaline inclusions. And, you know, they all look like this. Um, well, Penalfre, another way, all of the ones that I've seen and recognized look like this. It may be I've seen others that I didn't recognize. I dread to, to, to see if I find that out. But anyway, uh, for the moment, in my experience, they all look pretty much the same. And this is um, that patient that Antonina shared with me. She was a girl of 14 and she ended up, oh, she's got lots of them. I think she has nine or 10 or even more now. And again, these all show exactly the same morphology. Uh, and she, she had full investigations and there's no evidence that she has a germline mutation. So I don't know what's going to happen to her, whether she just continues getting these lesions or whether she's at risk for something else. I suppose time will tell. Anyway, she'll be very carefully followed up. And this is her lesion. Uh, there's a scanning view just to show you the little nodule. And here you can see the typical morphology. And um, this is BAP1. And remember, it's the nucleus that, that we're looking at because these lymphocytes express the nuclear antigen, but the tumor cells, the nuclei, are completely negative. And this is another one. Uh, this one presenting in the, uh, it's sort of a young person and it was adjacent to the ear. And again, it looks just the same. Again, we've got these hyaline inclusions. And uh, if we look at the tumor cells, you can see those vesicular nuclei are all BAP1 negative. And uh, this is a, this is a, uh, a last one, I think, uh, that Antonina recently shared with me, and I liked it because it particularly because it shows a very nice clinical lesion of pre-existent nevus, and then 
the, the tumor nodule at the edge of the lesion, and that's the scanning view. And if we look at this one in higher magnification, there is Nevis over here. Uh, I do beg your pardon, actually, having, I just realized that this last one, I've forgotten about it, this one does show a nice junctional component. So according to the literature, this might suggest the patient is uh, at risk of having a germline mutation, but I don't know whether that's been looked at or not. Uh, but anyway, here we see dermal nevus, and if I move on to the next slide, uh, you can see again the typical morphology. There's the lymphocytic infiltrate, and there's BAP1 showing complete lack of expression in the tumor cells. Oh, I forgot there's, there's this case here, which I, which I added because it's sort of an interesting one. Uh, here you, you can see the tumor nodule and over to the edge, there's a sort of a trichoepithelioma, trichoblastoma-like proliferation, but that's not why I'm showing you this particular lesion. There's pre-existent dermal nevus and there's typical bapoma. But then when, we, when I looked at it at, at high power, it's absolutely, whoops, I uh, beg your pardon. It's, uh, it's absolutely teeming with mitotic figures and there are four there. Uh, and I wasn't sure really where to, where to put this. This, I think there's more nuclear pleomorphism than there should be. So perhaps this is an example of, of a melanoma associated with loss of uh, BAP1 expression. I don't know the answer because I don't have any follow-up. So um, that's, uh, that's a fairly good display of uh, BAP1 inactivated uh, neva and melan melanocytoma. And so I'm going to move now to the other topic that I think is of great importance. And these are the, the receptor tyrosine kinase fusions, which account for, let me just see, well, just a bit less than 50% or so of uh, Spitz lesions that they're, they're seen in Spitz nevi, they're seen in atypical spitz nevi or uh, melanocytoma, if we want to use the WHO terminology. They're also seen in spitzoid melanoma. So it, the, the demonstration of, of a fusion product doesn't, it does not, it, it, it does not in any way tell you the biological potential of the lesion. It just tells you what caused it. But what, the, what I think the good thing about this is, is that if we, if we pull out all of the BAP1 lesions and we pull out all of the uh, tyrosine kinase fusions, we've actually managed to better classify the spitzoid neoplasms that we're looking at. So we end up all talking the same talk, if you like, but we are stuck with this unknown group. I would make the point that spitzoid melanoma does not, uh, is associated with, a, with, with H RAS uh, mutations, but it doesn't show BRAF or NRAS uh, as you would see in the regular, uh, in regular cutaneous melanoma, nor does it show KIT mutations either. So spitzoid melanoma is a very distinct entity and we'll come back to that at, at the end. And uh, I put this in more for my, to, to remind me, because as you know, I'm very much a morphologist. I do find the, the molecular data that we're acquiring absolutely fantastic. It really is transforming things. And this is a, 
uh, part of, a, of an illustration that Weisner's paper in 2014 showed where the, the, um, the, the purple uh, boxes rep represent gene fusions. And you can see uh, there are a lot of them. And then uh, with, with HRAS, we, we, we have point mutations. So we can identify the molecular basis for a lot of spitzoid neo neoplasms. And that's really great. And here, here um, uh, uh, another table from Weisner's paper, and he was looking at uh, uh, a, a total number of 140 cases, and you can see that Spitz Nevis shows kinase, kinase fusions in roughly 55%, uh, atypical Spitz tumors in 56%, and roughly 40% of spitzoid melanomas. So um, that's, uh, that's the background. This, and now I'm going to show you a number of examples. And again, I have to, uh, I can't stress how grateful I am to all of my friends on the key derm who have so generously shared cases with me and without whose cases I would not be able to give this presentation. And also to uh, John Han Ho from, uh, from Kiko.com. John Han is a professor of, path of pathology at, at the University of Pittsburgh. And he, he also has kindly shared cases. So this one, that Matthias uh, Bobos from Greece has shared was a 12-year-old female with a 0.7 centimeter diameter lesion on the thigh. And this is a lovely scanning view to show a, a very typical spitzoid lesion. And at low par, at low par, this, this I must say, it reminds me of the the spitzoid melanoma that uh, Kathleen Smith and her friends from the, the Armed Forces Institute of Pathology described in and around 1986. It, they were very, very uh, spindly, uh, fascicular, and had this rather wedge-shaped uh, architecture. So that's what that reminded me of when I first saw it. Now, if we look at this in close up, again, this picture, it highlights the spitzoid appearance with the retraction artifact, the conspicuous Camino bodies, and this uh, fascicular growth pattern, or it's a plexiform growth pattern. And if we look at this in, uh, this is ju just to, to, um, to draw your attention to, that's, that's an extension that's going along a neurovascular bundle or something. I'm not sure we can regard that necessarily as, as reflecting morphology at the deep margin, although it might be. But this bit over here certainly does. And those nests there are, are relatively large compared to the ones above it. So I think this is certainly giving us an idea that maturation is not all that it might have been. And if that's the case, maybe this, this is of significance. I, I was a bit uncertain about it, to be honest with you. But if we look at, um, if we look at the lesion more carefully, there are an awful lot of mitotic figures that, uh, that were present at the top in the middle uh, and this one here was towards the deep aspect. And the other interesting thing that this lesion showed was very extensive lymphovascular invasion. It was all over the place uh, and very, very dramatic. Now, some folk, uh, including my friend Eduardo Colongi, have described lymphovascular invasion as something that you might see in a uh, a completely banal classical Spitz nevus. And I'm sure that may well be the case, 
But I think in the context of this lesion, I would regard this as a very worrisome feature. And here's immunohistochemistry, just uh, P16 expression is not lost, um, but uh, this, is, this is cyclin D1, which is tremendously overexpressed. Right down, that's the deep margin, and you can see there are tumor cells expressing cyclin D1 at the base of the lesion. And here's ALK where you can see out expression throughout the, the length and breadth and the top and the bottom. And this is a vessel showing um, tumor cells expressing out. So I thought that was fascinating. And then um, Matthias asked for a sentinel node biopsy. And then on the H and E, you can see that there are, <coughs> sorry, conspicuous tumor, tumor present in that lymph node, <coughs> excuse me. And this is, um, this is melon A with uh, tyrosinase and key 67 expression. And you can see occasional nuclei are positive. I don't think we have any more follow-up. So I, I don't know what happened to this patient, but uh, from the literature, it would seem likely that this should be all that would happen to the patient uh, in that, that uh, out one um, expressing melanocytomas certainly can extend to the um, sentinel lymph node, but the biological behavior is generally believed to be good. So these, this is a little bit of data uh, from what I could get from the literature uh, that they, they've been described as, as early as in a five month old child, which I thought was pretty fascinating. Uh, they're typically on the extremities and the case I showed you is pretty typical. Large spindle shapes in a plexiform or fascicular growth pattern. And um, uh, variable sentinel lymph node involvement. I just wanted to remind myself and you that when we look at the Ross one uh, variants, they tend to be more spitzoid. And this is a, another lovely example. Again, this is one that, whoops, uh, Antonina, uh, Karl Makova very kindly shared with me a lesion on the shoulder of a male of eight years of age. And uh, even at this magnification, you can make out that it's spindled and you can make out there's a fascicular growth pattern. So at low power, you might well wonder, is this going to turn out to be an alt fusion. And there's a slightly higher power view emphasizing the, um, the growth pattern. But you can see at the bottom that the lesion is clearly maturing with depth in terms of nest size. The nest at the top are huge. And as you work your way down, they get smaller and smaller. So that would suggest that this is quite benign. And so that's the top. And there is the middle. And this one showed uh, mitotic figures, as you see there and there. And then this is the bottom of the lesion showing maturation with depth. I'll just go back to those mitoses. I, again, I just want to remind the younger people in the audience that mitoses are to be expected in a growing nevus and in an eight-year-old boy the nevus is without doubt growing and uh, cells divide and uh, and that's how the lesion grows so you must expect to see mitotic figures it's when you see abnormal forms and mitotic figures at the very depth of the lesion uh, then you start getting much more concerned, as we'll come to later. Anyway, that's the base of that lesion. Now, isn't that beautiful? That's ALK. 
And uh, gosh, the, it's just such a beautiful image that I, I was delighted with it. Uh, and not only can you see the expression of the protein, but it also is a very clear uh, demonstration of maturation with large nests getting smaller and smaller and smaller at the bottom. And at the bottom, you can see single cells. So you can look at that, that immunohistochemistry and you don't need the h &E. If you just had that slide alone, it would do very well. And you can say this is a Spitz nevus and that's the end of it. And this is a this is a lovely one that uh, Nima Ardakani from Path West in Perth kindly shared with me, and uh, it, in this one it looks much more like a typical Spitz nevus, and again was benign. And then Matthias shared this case with me, and this is another beautiful case. It's a rather um, flattish, almost more like a plaque than, than the uh, lesions we've looked at previously. And it's very cellular. And when we look uh, at close up, this deep extension, again, that sort of reminds me a bit of the, um, the, the um, spitzoid melanoma that Catherine Smith described, but this one turns out to be an NTRK1 fusion product. And th there's a nice demonstration on the right of HMB45 expression being lost with, uh, with depth. And then lastly, I wanted to talk about very briefly about spitzoid melanoma. And um, one of the things we have to remember is we need to look at things in context. And I've mentioned this time and time and time again. One must look at the big picture before, before getting down to high power examination. Otherwise, you'd end up diagnosing spitzoid melanoma all over the place. It's very easy to make that mistake. So how do we recognize it? Well, they tend to be big uh, and they're often greater than, than a centimeter or more in diameter. And they're very frequently ulcerated. So ulceration and large size and rapid growth, those are all features that might raise the possibility that you could be looking at, at a, a spitzoid melanoma. Um, and when you look at it at higher power, if you see a face or consumption of the epidermis, again, that's something that shoves you more towards spitzoid melanoma and less towards uh, a, a, a melanocytoma. And then I've mentioned this frequently, large nodules. And that's, a, that's always a great big clue. If you see large nodules, particularly if they're deep in the lesion, they should always worry you. Um, the literature suggests that uh, key 67 expression suggests malignant spitz tumor. I have no idea whether okay. that's true or not, but okay. used it. And this is, this is perhaps is the important thing. From the immunohistochemistry and molecular side, uh, nearly 40% show kinase fusions, but in addition, they do show other molecular alterations which have tipped the tumor up from melanocytoma into a melanoma. And uh, just to remind you that the more typical uh, melanoma molecular markers are absent in spitzoid melanoma. And I'm going to show you a couple of cases. This was one that uh, Antonina very recently shared with me. It was a bit fortuitous in, in preparing this talk. I suddenly found myself in possession of two beautiful cases, which have made the 
and they talk that much better. So the first is Antoninus, and this is a male age 10 with a very large lesion. I think it was a, over a centimeter on the face. And you can see that the middle of it's ulcerated and you can make out nodules all over the place. So the low power view is very concerning. And then if we look at it a bit closer, uh, there's another view. Again, I just wanted to highlight the ulceration and draw your attention to nodules. Now, they do look as if they're getting smaller as you go deeper into the lesion, but I think I'll show you that's, that's a bit of false, false information or misinformation. They don't really show maturation at all when you look at them at higher magnification the top of the lesion it looks very spitzoidy and then we come there there's the bottom of the lesion there and um that is the bottom there and there is some maturation with depth but the tumor cells themselves are not really any much smaller than they were at the top and here there are there are there's one two, three, and that might, there might be a fourth there. There are probably four mitotic figures in that field. There are two together there, and there were mitoses all over the place. And so Antonina, and I think she's quite right, she diagnosed that as a, a malignant spitz, or a spitzoid melanoma, and here we see complete loss of P60 in expression. And um, this is cyclin D1, and uh, just about every single nucleus showed expression of cyclin D1. I don't know whether she did K67, I didn't see it, but she may have done that, and she can tell us more about it in a comment if, if she wants to, and also if she has any more follow-up. I don't think this case was sent for any molecular workup. The problem is um, getting molecular studies, it, it, it still remains very expensive. And uh, in, the, in Ukraine, for example, the patient would have to pay for that and they may not be in a position to be able to afford it. So although it's wonderful when people do it, uh, we have to remember that it's, somebody's got to pay for it. And then I've got this lovely case, which uh, Dr. Tommy Ferringer from Geisinger in Pennsylvania and uh, shared with John Han Ho in, from Kiko and the University of Pittsburgh. And then he shared it with me and it's a, it's a super case. Uh, this is a young boy. I don't know what the site was, but you can see this, this dome-shaped nodule. Those are the two different cuts. And again, it looks as if there's maturation, but that's not really true. Uh, and we'll look at it in close-up. And there's the junctional component. It's very spitzoid. It's got a nice retraction artifact. The cells are discohesive. So if you just had that field alone, you might be thinking more of a Spitz nevus, except for the fact that they, these nests are quite, they're larger at the bottom than they are immediately beneath the, the, uh, the epidermis. And um, so uh, he, here we have uh, um, the, the, the superficial part. This is the middle part. There's an eccrine duct there. That's the bottom of the lesion and you can see the ink there and there's a mitosis right at the bottom of the lesion and this this patient was shown to have a homozygous deletion of 9p21. Now I'm not, I'm not sure um, what that necessarily tells us because in the literature there are papers suggesting that homozygous deletion of 9p21 is associated with a very poor prognosis, but then I came across papers saying the opposite. So again, 
I'm a bit stuck on this one. I, I'm working on the assumption that this is a, a bad prognostic indicator, but it would be very useful if members of the audience, particularly those with a, a background of molecular pathology could weigh in on that, just to give, a, uh, give, the, give us their thoughts. And lastly, I put this case in because I, I found it, I had it in my rhabdoid melanoma folder and I, I know nothing about it uh, clinically, absolutely nothing. I don't even know the site, but it's, uh, it's a very old case and I apologize, it's a bit purple, but I didn't have time to play with the color. It would take too much time. But what was interesting was the, the histology is hideous with very marked nuclear pleomorphism, prominent nuclei, loads of mitoses. Mitoses were all over the place. And so I, I classified this as a, a rhabdoid melanoma, but I'm wondering now whether that might also fit most probably into uh, a melanoma associated with BAT1 inactivation. And so that summarizes at the bottom the molecular information that one would see uh, in spitzoid melanoma, roughly 40% with kinase fusions, plus all of these other molecular changes. And that brings me to my last slide. And as you know, as you know, dermatopathology, dermatopathology is my third love in life. My first love is obviously Gracie, and you'll be horrified to know that, um, that my, uh, my second love in life it remains Ferrari. And I have to show you this, this picture as a little bit of marketing because I thought it's very important that you guys remember that the new edition of McKee's Pathology of the Skin, it's, it's a tremendous investment. And you know, your children and your grandchildren and your cousins and nephews and nieces, they would all benefit from a copy of this book. And if you all do that, then this most gorgeous Ferrari might just become mine. So I hope this I hope this presentation has been helpful. I hope it's been clear. I've I've tried jolly hard to, to bring clarity to the topic. I think it's helped me a lot enormously to get a better understanding of spitzoid lesions and where we are in 2020. And I look forward to your comments and questions. So thank you very much.